Hi, everyone. Um, it's always a bit intimidating to speak at a public event. It's extraordinarily uh, intimidating, intimidating to be speaking after the folks that have been part of this session because uh, some of them, like Allah, I've known online since 2005, 2006. I was part of the, um, one of the online uh, protesters, that, uh, part of an advocacy campaign that tried to get him out of jail five years ago. But he and I had never met before until last night. And so, uh, so it's incredible finally being in a place to start meeting these people uh, who actually took part on the ground in the revolutions. I'm sure some of them I'll never meet. There have just been too many of them, literally all over the region. There's one I do hope to meet, though she hasn't actually participated in the revolution, and that's because she was born this weekend. Uh, her name is Maya, and her, uh, she was uh, born in Libya. One of many children, I'm sure, born in Libya this weekend. But her parents were Mohammed and Perdita Nabus. Um, I don't know if these names mean anything to you, uh, but I hope they will in the, the few minutes that I have here. Uh, if you remember, as the revolutions uh, proceeded, first in Tunisia and then in Egypt, suddenly there was a spark, and it was almost like overnight protests were starting in other countries simultaneously. Uh, and so one of those countries was Libya, and as was the case in Egypt and elsewhere, they declared a date on their calendar in which they wanted to start their revolution. I put it in Outlook so I made sure I wouldn't forget it. And um, the handful of people who were online, uh, like Jillian said, 5% of the population at most was online, and that's before all of this started. But a handful of these people started to document and share what they were seeing as the protests grew and grew and grew. And one of the first people doing this was Mo Nabus. Um, when Benghazi was in the process of being liberated, he and some others managed to jury rig a satellite internet connection, and they set up this homegrown studio, and he decided to become the equivalent of Radio Free Benghazi. Uh, he used Livestream, the, you know, the service Livestream.com, and every day for hours at a time, you would see him sitting there with headphones or a mobile phone in his ear, talking to people all over Libya, repeating first-hand accounts as to what they were seeing and what they were experiencing. And uh, when they were having the conversation in Arabic, there'd be a chat room and people would be translating it in real time. As time passed, he got more involved. He started producing videos in which he spoke directly to camera, demanding that the world take notice of what was going on uh, in Libya. Uh, and they started to. It, uh, over a period of weeks, it became pretty clear that the West was going to get involved. Early the morning, the day NATO decided to start their attack campaign, Mo decided to go out because uh, uh, Gaddafi had promised a ceasefire that would have started the day before, and he wasn't convinced it was happening. In fact, he heard rockets landing in the southern part of Benghazi. And so I recall 1 a.m. East Coast time here in the U.S., what, listening to him drive around, talking in his phone, and the phone being picked up on live stream as he tried to find the bombing site. I probably stayed up until 2 a.m. as he was figuring this out, but it was still too dark there. It was just, it, the dawn was rising, basically. So I went to bed. I woke up early, probably around 6.30, just to see where things picked up, and there was a video loop playing showing Muhammad walking around a house that had clearly been hit by um, a missile, and there was blood in the bed of a children's room. And so, a horrible situation, but nonetheless, he'd gotten the story. He had recorded it. And you just knew within moments that that video was going to be picked up by CNN and every other news network as one of the latest videos coming out of Libya. But then I started getting tweets from people asking me, is it true Mohammed is dead? Did you hear Mo died last night? And I started saying, what are you talking about? I talked to him four or five hours ago. I was listening to him live. He's not dead. And then I looked through the archive of what had been posted the hour before that, and it was the voice of his wife, Perdita, explaining that he had been killed in those four or five hours that I slept. And in fact, he streamed his own death. He had gone out after that assignment that he had given himself, and he went down to another part of southern Benghazi, and he wanted to see an area where there was supposedly a firefight 
taking place. He showed up in a pickup truck with his uncle. The uncle didn't think it was safe, so we tried to go back, and Mo said, go back without me. I'll be all, I'll, I'll be all right here. And in the, in the stream, it's only audio, there's no video, because he was doing it through his phone, you hear bullets flying back and forth, and he is narrating it like he was, uh, it, like he was going into D-Day, like the best reporters of the 1940s would, play by play what was going on. And then all of a sudden you hear a zip sound, and it goes dark. Absolute silence. As far as we can tell, that captured the moment he died. What's most amazing about this story, Mo Nabus, literally probably the first person in several generations in Libya to be an independent journalist in that country. There were others at this point, of course. You know, people had started picking up on Twitter and other citizen journalism groups had started in Misrata and the Nafusa Mountains and elsewhere, but he was the first one, and he was now dead. And his wife had to announce this on the stream, and when she announced it, obviously you could hear the pain in her voice, but as that pain transmitted itself all over the world, you could hear the sense of defiance and solidarity and in fact, she said she was going to take over Mo's job. She was almost eight months pregnant at this point. It was their, they knew that they were going to have a first child. They had fortunately selected a name already. Uh, but she would use every bit of time that she could until she would deliver the baby to run the station that he had set up. And so day after day after day over the last several months, two and a half months, Perdita has been doing exactly the same thing he did translating what people were telling them over phone and via text messaging, taking questions from all over the world, organizing volunteers to do the translations in real time. Now, I'm sure a lot of you probably thought I was going to talk about the work I've been doing because I've been very active on Twitter over the last six months. I never expected to be doing this. Uh, if you would talk to me in November of last year, I assumed I'd be working on some ridiculous social media project that I usually would be doing at NPR. But somehow I got, I got hooked into it. I, I, I cared too much about Tunisia. I cared too much about Egypt to ignore it. And so I tweeted and tweeted and tweeted until it basically became a full-time job for me. But I just wanted to make a point that what I'm doing pales in comparison, is an absolute joke in comparison to the Mo Nabuses of the world and the Perdita Nabuses of the world and to all the people in Libya who were tweeting up until the beginning of March and suddenly vanished because the internet got shut off. Of all those sources I had since then, I had then, I've only been able to track down one of them. I can only hope they're still alive. Whether they are or not, like Mo, Perdita, and the rest of them, they have provided a service, not only for their country, but for the rest of us, to show how a group of people with no media training whatsoever can become the voices of their country. Thank you.